Okay, how's it going, everyone? So we're going to read some Lev Vygotsky again today. This is 1926 uh, from his book, Educational Psychology, Chapter 12, Ethical Behavior. This section is called The Nature of Ethics from the Psychological Point of View. <clears throat> the problem of moral education is among those questions that are now undergoing a reassessment in psychology and in culture in the most decisive and most thoroughgoing fashion. The thousand-year link between morality and religion has been broken, and under the force of analysis, morality is, the, is beginning to acquire an increasingly tempor, tempor, temporal character. It is now possible to establish beyond all reasonable doubt the experiential temporal character of morality and its dependence on historical and social conditions and its class character. Every nationality and every epoch, epoch and likewise uh, every class, possesses its own morality which is always a product of social psychology. There is the morality of the, of the Hottentot, who, it is said, responds when asked the question, what do you consider to be good and what do you consider to be bad? By declaring, good is when I steal a wife, bad is when I am robbed. Moral concepts and ideas vary depending upon the social environment, and what is considered bad at one time and in one place elsewhere might be considered the greatest of all virtues. And if there are any common feature in all these different manifestations of moral consciousness that can be identified, this is only because certain common elements shared by every human society were once part of the social order. Thus, from the standpoint of social psychology, ethics must be looked upon as a certain form of social behavior that was established and evolved in the interests of the ruling class and is different for different classes. This is why there has always existed a morality of the ruler and a morality of slaves. And this is why ep epochs characterized by crisis have represented the greatest crisis of morality. It is said that in the schools of ancient Sparta, children were forced to wait upon a common table while the adults had their meals. A child had to steal something from the table and he would be punished only if he couldn't do this or only if he were caught red-handed. The moral lesson of this experiment was to steal and not get caught. Such an ideal was entirely conditioned by the communist order of the closed arist aristocratic society of Sparta, in which concern for property did not constitute the standard of morality, in which stealing, therefore, was not considered a sin, but where force, craftiness, cunning, and composure constituted the ideal of all citizens of Sparta, and where the greatest sin was the inability to deceive someone else and to control one's emotions. As in every school of thought, moral education here coincides entirely with the class morality, which guides the school in France, which guides the school. In France, where special classes in ethics have been introduced and where there are textbooks of morality in use, the educational ideal consists in those bourgeois virtues, which permeate the mind and soul of French middle class. In one French textbook on morality, for example, there are hardly any ethical standards, according to M. M. Rubinstein, and in their place thriftiness is exalted, and bank books turn into the criterion of morality. Such class ideals are inherent to all other systems of education. This was also the case in the pre-revolutionary secondary schools, which were constructed on authoritarian foundations, in which obedience was considered the ideal for the student, and the general goals of moral education were to educate a loyal subject or a hard-working official. Now that the world has experienced the cleansing threat of social revolution, the very foundations of bourgeois morality are trembling. It is very possible that in no other realm do we meet up with such shapeless, shapeless and tenuous ideas as in the domain of ethical standards? All those rules of bourgeois morality, which were fully laden with hypocrisy and mendacity, have lost their meaning. Bourgeois morality was compelled to be hypocritical because it taught one thing and did another, because it was constructed at the juncture of class interests and in preaching the kingdom of God after death. Implanted a kingdom of enslavers in the world. Lies and hypocrisy were the natural source of such a form of morality and sanctimoniousness was its inevitable accomp accompaniment. The child saw one thing out in the world and was told something else altogether, and all the school's endeavor was oriented towards reconciling this divergence between real life and morality and the child as effortlessly as possible. The child either was unable to reconcile the two, or, if he was taught how to do so, he would become accustomed to viewing morality as a kind of social decorum that everyone had to observe. Though this always entailed great effort, in fact, it was only through such effort that he could assume this point of view. The child's moral consciousness could be reduced to the convictions of Gribodov's chambermaid, i.e., 
that, quote, there's nothing wrong with sinning, just don't spread rumors, end quote. The fear of moral retribution supplied the compulsory sanction for morality. In addition to public opinion and in his moral behavior, man was easily guided psychologically by the very same custodial rules. This you should not do, but that you may do, and usually guided himself in all his behavior in precisely this way. One Russian philosopher was right in the sense to refer to these moral concepts as embodying a kind of, quote, moral policeman, end quote. Since the force of moral precepts was rooted in the compulsory and humiliating power of fear, in the face of moral punishment, and the pangs of conscience, there was a special morality of the strong and the weak. And just as in regard to external laws, so in regard to the laws of conscience, the weak would submit to them, and the strong would rebel against them, and break these laws. In its revolt against bourgeois morality, European philosophy proclaimed the immorality of its own basic laws, and speaking through Nietzsche's lips, declared itself to be beyond good and evil. Shestov said that man's relation to the categorical imperative is just like the attitude of the Russian peasant towards that forest of tall trees which Peter the Great had forbidden to cut down. In both cases, there is the attraction of an entirely arbitrary deed, though the individual still confronts the fear of retribution and punishment, in the one case external and in the other case internal. The moral commandment, quote, do not kill, end quote, has always been understood in just this sense. That is, quote, do not kill, not because that's the wrong road to take, but because you yourself will die from the pangs of conscience. End quote. This is the internal contradiction of bourgeois morality, was exposed by Dostoevsky's skill in Crime and Punishment, in Nietzsche's Revolt. The overall negative critical work of his thinking in its attack on bourgeois morality had the force of a stick of dynamite, exploding the very foundations of Christian morality from within. A new morality will be created once a new human society will have been created. But at that point, it is likely that moral behavior will have been entirely dissolved into general forms of behavior. All of behavior in general will be moral, because there will be no basis whatsoever for any conflict between the behavior of one person and the behavior of society in general. Here it is possible to take note only of several points that the, pedagogics, that the pedagogics of moral behavior must deal with. Note, first the negation of the absolute supra-empirical super roots of morality, or of any in it morality of feelings. From the psychological point of view, moral behavior, like everything else, arises on the foundation of in it and instinctive reactions, and evolves under the influence of the methodical effects of the environment. Without question, the foundation of moral feelings have to be sought in the instinctive sense of sympathy for another person, and social instincts, and in much else besides. As it comes into contact with every imaginable datum concept, datum concept and phenomena in the process of growth, these in it reactions turn into these conditional forms of behavior we refer to collectively as moral behavior. Hence the general conclusion that moral behavior is a form of behavior which is amen am amenable to education through the social environment in exactly the same way as is everything else. We should also bear in mind the uncertainty that now pervades morality. On the one hand, revolutionary boldness is needed, not a narrow-minded view of things, in order to discern what is happening. What is its genuine meaning and to how much and to how to reject all those prejudices with only recently everyone believed to be unshakable moral tenets? All that is left of bourgeois morality, like the corrupt legacy of a previous life, all this must be swept clear out of our schools. On the other hand, however, there is a certain risk concealed in this impermanence of present-day morality. The risk that all moral restraint will be lifted and the child's behavior become entirely arbitrary. Bear in mind that such utter immoralism, the complete absence of all restraining principles, will return us to those native ideals where our natural instincts are pursued, ideals which we have left, which we have left far behind, in which modern man can in no way agree with. We cannot agree to the blind pursuit of the demands of our instincts, because we know in advance that these demands were begotten by previous epochs and are the residue of the long past experience of adaptation to vanished environmental conditions and consequently pull us back rather than carry us forward. Moreover, that the instincts must inevitably be, be restricted to and adapt to new conditions in the world constitutes the essential condition of education. Consequently, within that certain uncertain chaos which the present day state of morality presents. There are a number of such moral standards which have been the basis of man's social behavior, and which nevertheless have to be recognized. 
It is not the responsibility of educational psychology to arrive at exact definitions of the form and content of these moral standards. This is the something for social ethics. While the business of psychology is simply to find out whether it is even conceivable to put this into practice in the real world. Bear in mind that all those revolutionary epochs, when the old order breaks down and falls apart, often represent such an improbable combination of the most diverse moral cultures that the child may sometimes find it utterly impossible to make any sense of this confusion. Moral crisis, therefore, lie in wait for the child at every step of the way, and consequently, the teacher and educator can in no way ignore questions of moral education. No other epoch creates such magnificent opportunities for moral heroism, and in no other epoch is there such a risk of moral degra degra degradation. Getting accustomed to the spirit of the epoch, to those great currents which permeate the world, is the only criterion here. The purely aesthetic and passive perception of the clarion call of revolution, to which Bloch passionately summoned the Russian intelligentsia, writing that, quote, with all your body, with all your heart, with all your consciousness, heed the call of revolution. This cannot serve as a foundation in moral education, inasmuch as heeding the call of revolution once upon a time will not lead to active involvement in revolution. And if the poet summons is to be applied to our actions, it has to re so resonate that its meaning expressed the demand not simply to listen to, but to himself create the music of revolution. The third basic feature of moral education in our epoch is found in that aspect of truth that distinguishes the ethical outlook which is being created right before our eyes. Truth in the unflinching capacity to face reality squarely in the eye in all the most difficult and all the most confusing circumstances in life. <clears throat> this is the first demand of revolutionary morality. Never before could moral education have reached such an exact inexorable and absolute truth is now, when absolutely every undisclosed moral value has been put on the map and revealed in its true form. In this, as in all other realms, a revolutionary epoch is scarcely able to suggest consummate systems of morality, whatever the previous epochs might have boasted of. Though on the other hand, we may impose on our moral education various individual demands that go well beyond the, the demands imposed in preceding epochs. We can require that Soviet education train fighters and revolutionaries in the realm of morality, as in all other realms. We should not set out with the abstract ideal of creating an entire personality. Such a, such a personality does not exist, and since such an education would neglect contemporary goals and turn into a game of verbal gymnastics. We confront the concrete goals of training, the adults of the next epoch, the adults of the next generation, in full accord with the historical role which will be their lot. Hence the extraordinary degree of specificity and integrity, which have become the foundation of moral education in our epoch. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's uh, Lev Vygotsky. That's uh, The Nature of Ethics from the Psychological Point of View, 1926. So that's, um, you know, a few years after, you know, the Soviet Union was established. So, yeah, um, yeah, thank you all for listening this is uh, very good for people who are involved in education very very crucial very important that's it is our future so um you know my uh you know follow me online facebook twitter youtube tiktok tumblr medium marxist saw m-a-r-x-i-s-t space s-a-w y'all have a great day without a goalie